So we all know Disney for their rides, but really they're masters of storytelling. Here to talk about the convergence of VR and storytelling, please give it up for Senior Vice President of R&D at Walt Disney Imagineering, John Snotty. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm getting things set up here. I'm John. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, my, um, uh, I, I work at Disney. I'm uh, part of the research and development group. I lead three groups there, actually. Um, the, the first one is uh, uh, Disney Research, which is a uh, research organization that sort of works out on the frontiers of science. We, we try to solve hard problems that make sense for Disney and, and bring those technologies into the company. Uh, the second one is a group called Advanced Development that, that takes those, those uh, uh, emerging science topics and uh, uh, places and, and packages them in a way that our theme park designers can use. So that group is embedded in the, the theme park, the Imagineering theme park group. And, and that's about uh, uh, really taking, taking new technologies and moving them into, into the parks. And the third thing is a, is a, um, a group called the Technology Studio that does uh, that, that does the uh, work of, of, um, of, of uh, productizing and building the actual code that we run the business on and that, that, uh, uh, that, that allows us to run the attractions. Um, I want to talk about story because uh, I think it's important. It's, it's very much uh, central to everything that, that the company I work for does. Story is sort of the glue that holds everything together. It's it, every conversation is a conversation about story at Disney. And um, uh, it, it seems fairly obvious, but, but it is uh, really a, a, a thing that drives us all. Um, you know, story is a, a um, kind of an ancient thing, you know, the picture there of a, of a storyteller. And if you've ever watched a storyteller, it's, it's kind of cool to watch. The, the, it's, it's a very interactive process. The, the storyteller, um, you know, intently looks at the audience and, and the audience, uh, you know, pays attention to the storyteller, but the storyteller will, you know, with his voice, with the pacing, with the cadence, with the volume, with, with the subject matter even. And all of that is to, uh, is, is to draw and to get in sync with the audience. And, and, and when they get in sync, it's really amazing to watch because, it, you know, the whole group, the audience move, they move as a unit. We've done studies on this and you watch and see how people uh, as a group start to get in sync and start to, to get in sync with the storytelling. It's really cool. Uh, many of you maybe have had a similar experience. Uh, when, my, uh, when my kids were little, my, my boys were, were little, they would want me to tell stories at night. And, and it's interesting that um, uh, they would come to me to tell stories and I implicit in that is that, that uh, you know, they could tell stories to each other or they could tell stories, I guess, to themselves. They could read a book, but actually they wanted me to tell a story. So they assumed I would bring something to the table. And so as I would tell stories, you know, uh, again, I, I was struck by how, what an interactive process it, it is, uh, storytelling, especially to little kids, because they're so expressive. You can really read their faces and their body language and, and see what they're, they're thinking. And, um, and as you, uh, you know, as, as if they would start to nod off, I could make the story more scary and they would, they would perk up. If it got too scary, I could change the story or, or, or in fact, they would change the story. You know, they would just interrupt and say, wait, no, no. It's not a monster, it's, it's a bunny. And so suddenly this is about a bunny and we're off and, and going again. But, um, but that interactive process is, is pretty cool. And so lots of ways to think about story, but, but let's say it, a story is something that has a setting and props and characters. And, and the story is what sort of animates all of those things. The story is what makes those things make sense. Uh, w without them, it's just a collection of stuff without the story. And, you know, the, uh, for, uh, stories are not always about, you know, a, a fixed beginning, middle, and end, a, a straight linear narrative like that. There's all sorts of things that, that feel like story. But it's, uh, it's an, an, an action that, that uh, makes all of these things uh, fit together. 
lot of different technologies, you know, uh, uh, books, um, you know, probably, you know, the, the second oldest type of storytelling maybe is books. And, and what an astounding technology. It, you know, it hasn't been around when you think of the, the course of humanity. Uh, books have not really been around that long. And, uh, and yet they, they have this ability to, to uh, allow an author to, to pack all this, this stuff into that story. Uh, they, they can do these amazingly detailed uh, 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 descriptions of scenery, of, of interactions, and, and um, it's, it's such a crazy thing that an author could pack enough stuff into this device that we call a book that you could spend a whole summer with it, you can spend a year with it, you can read it over and over and over, and it's, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. You know, films, on the other hand, another r really amazing medium for, for storytelling. And, and that takes, you know, the, the, the narrative of a book, but also adds kind of more, more media, more sensory inputs. You know, we can, do, we can do sound effects, we can do music, and we can use music to, to really start to signal things that are coming. You know, just the music tells you that, oh, uh, they're going to fall in love, or oh, boy, something terrible is behind that door. And, and it is another uh, bunch of dimensions that happen in storytelling. But it's not all about, you know, really high resolution or really long form. You know, things like cartoons work really well, too. Phineas and Ferb or, or South Park, they're, they're these very, very simple, simple uh, structures that, that also speak very well to us, very eloquently, and it makes it make sense. It, it, it uh, makes these characters uh, come to life. So what does all this have to do with VR? Um, I've... Um, I've, I've done this VR thing for a long time. Uh, uh, this is, this is uh, you know, the, the kind of second time around in VR for me. Uh, that's me uh, about a thousand years ago when I had hair. And uh, uh, <laughs> that's embarrassing to watch. Um, but uh, in this particular case, we were sort of uh, play, we were playing around with how do you navigate around a, a, a virtual world. In this case, we had this, this uh, leaning thing that we were working on. But we would almost immediately, when we started playing with that, we started playing... Uh, to to understand what is unique about this new medium, what is what allows, what does it allow, what does it do better than a book, what does it do worse than a book, and and to try to understand how all of this could could be used uh, in the thing that my company does, which is uh, allow people to interact with characters and story, and so um, we we we're moving at that time, uh, looks like that was 1990, uh, we were moving at that time toward exploring could you do a theme park attraction with VR, and it turns out no. Uh, at that time especially, uh, the, it was just really too early, and, and so we, um, we, we moved on from there and, and did other things with it and have used it for, we use it in design a lot now and, and are looking at all sorts of things. But, you know, if you, uh, many of you probably have the same experience that if you're one of the people who is showing VR to a lot of people for the first time, you, you find this thing that happens. You, you give somebody a headset, they put it on, they look around and they go, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Oh, wow, this is, this is crazy. I'm, I'm immersed and, and yet I'm still standing here and yet I'm in this world. And, and they do that for a minute or two until they sort of get their bearings and then they go, wow, cool. And then, of course, ask the question, now what? And, and that's a question that I think lingers uncomfortably today uh, in, in a lot of instances. And it's one that I, th I think that we, we are finally starting to address. But, but I'd like to pose a few things about that. Um, that. That, you know, while VR can be amazing and while VR can be uh, astounding, it, it can't be important until it's meaningful to me. Um, there are a lot of people doing some, some you know, pretty cool uh, VR worlds these days. Uh, that there's a picture of uh, a thing from The Void that, that we did, that uh, ILM did for The Void. It's a, it's a great piece. If you haven't seen it, you should go uh, 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 look at it because it's a great picture of kind of the state of the art of VR. It's, it's not the only one. Other people are doing great work as well. Uh, but it's a nice, uh, nice picture of that. But as I look at what's going on in the world of VR, um, we get better and better and better at the technology side of it, and better and better and better at the, the production side of it. You know, we, we get to where we can, you know, the, the, the screen resolution is going up, the cables are disappearing, the, the compute power is increasing, the, the headsets get lighter. Um, but, but the real thing that, that is starting to, to, to bother me about that is this, this thing that the farther we go into reality, the farther, the more realistic things look, the more we get into 
what I feel like is another version of the uncanny valley. You know, the uncanny valley that, that, uh, that says that as a robot starts to look more and more human, uh, there's a point, it gets better and better, and there's a point, though, at which it switches and becomes really strange and awkward and, and makes you uncomfortable to look at them. And uh, I'm finding the same thing in, in VR worlds. As the worlds become higher and higher resolution, as they become more and more like reality, for me, I feel like my brain switches into this thing of, okay, this is reality. I know what that is. I know the rules. I know how that works. And then when that world doesn't um, work that way, I, I find that confusing. And I find just something deep inside me feels uh, uh, put off by that. And so we're, you know, uh, uh, there's this, this, this relentless, constant march toward higher resolution and better quality. And, and all that's great. You know, let's don't stop that. But I think we have to go uh, beyond that. Um, let's do a little thought experiment. So imagine a, a virtual world that is, is perfect in every way. It has, um, it has infinite resolution. I can walk right up to something and look at it and it never gets all pixelated or I never see the, the polygon edges. Uh, one that has haptics that work perfectly, that I can touch things and they feel right. It's the right kind of material, the right temperature. The, 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 I don't get sick as I walk around. I can walk anywhere I want. You know, that, that the, the color depth is, is infinite. Um, and I think that if you imagine all of that, that is kind of what modern theme parks are like. You know, it's pretty crazy how far uh, theme parks have gone these days. And I don't mean Disney, it's uh, the, the, you know, the folks across town at Universal, you know, you go to Harry Potter's world and you, know, you stand there and look around and it's complete, it's seamless. And the same thing here in uh, uh, the Avatar land that we built it in Florida or um, Cars land. You, know, you stand in the middle of Radiator Springs and you feel like, well, I'm, I'm kind of here, this is great. And, and uh, these worlds are, they feel complete, they feel uh, very high resolution, they, they, uh, they, they, they kind of look the way they're supposed to look. And uh, another one, uh, the Pirates uh, of the Caribbean in Shanghai, at, at the Shanghai Disney, it's really, uh, if you get over to Asia, that's worth seeing, it's a pretty amazing experience. But it's a, these are worlds that are virtual worlds in a sense, and, and they are not the end themselves. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, the first time I worked at Disney, long, long ago, uh, back in the late 80s, um, a friend of mine was a, he was a big shot at Disney. He was a, a, a big executive, and he managed to finagle sort of the, the, the theme park lover's ultimate dream. He had them open Disneyland two hours early so that he and his family could have a whole park to themselves. They could walk around wherever they wanted. They could do, ride whatever they wanted. And so they did. They'd go walking down Main Street and walk up, and the first thing they rode was their favorite attraction, Big Thunder Mountain, which is a roller coaster that you know, goes through mountains. And, and they went, uh, as they were riding it, and the, the first drop they came to, they went over the hill and started going down, and, and his daughter screamed, and, and they all looked at her, and they all looked at each other, and, and they realized it felt kind of weird to be in this giant theme park by themselves, rattling around with, with nobody else there. And they got off and said, you know, there's something wrong here. This is... And, and it, was a, it was kind of a, a moment of epiphany for them to, to realize that a theme park is not about the stuff, it's about us in the stuff. <laughs> it's about the, the people, the, the, the guests, the, the characters, the, the actors, the stories, all of that together in an amazing, beautiful place. And if you take all those people out of that, it's kind of a beautiful place, but it's really just a backdrop and it feels kind of strange. Uh, I was in a, a hotel recently, um, and it was a you know it was a, a nice hotel. I, I went there, kind of expensive, and uh, you know the lobby was made out of all the right materials. It seemed to be kind of well designed, uh, uh, you know, marble and and great nice wood and and fabrics and all things you would expect to see in an expensive hotel lobby. But the way it was designed, there was no place to sit. There was no place for people to congregate, so they didn't congregate there. It always seemed empty. And an empty, beautiful space feels kind of strange. It, it doesn't feel like you, you want to be there. Nobody else is there, so you, you move on. And I think that that's something we're going to have to really think about as we press towards higher and higher resolution and better and better quality, that, that as we build you know, a beautiful, amazing, spooky forest, it's kind of interesting, but, but I'm not going to pay to go there, certainly not going to pay to go there twice. Now what? You know, you get there and, and something has to happen. So 
If you take that spooky forest, though, and you say, let's zoom out a little bit, and, oh, look, there's some characters there. Hey, wait a minute. This is getting interesting. But that's not enough. Let me just say, I don't believe that's enough there yet. Those characters have to seem real to me. They have to know that I'm there. They have to have some opinion about me. I have to have an opinion about them. I have to be able to interact with them in a way that feels real in that environment. And if I don't, it's going to feel awkward. If I, you know, if, if uh, I, you know, you've seen things where there, there are captures, uh, immersive captures uh, of, of uh, concerts and uh, uh, basketball games and all sorts of things like that. And I feel like those things are starting to get there and there's a grain of something that's amazing and will be really good one day. But, but I also feel this sort of strangeness that I'm sitting next to people that don't know that I'm there. I'm a ghost. I'm a voyeur. And, th and it feels awkward to be there, like I'm not supposed to be there. So I think the next generation of VR, the next generation of VR, the big leap forward is not going to be about more polygons. It's not going to be about lighter weight headsets. Hopefully we get both of those. Hopefully we get much better displays. Hopefully we get all of those things. But I think that the next step is about story. Um, we do, uh, at, at uh, research and development, we do a, a lot of work these days on story and on, on alternative forms of story and the things that go into virtual worlds. I want to make sure that uh, I'm not, that nobody thinks that I'm announcing something here. I'm not. There's no uh, big VR attraction about to open at Disneyland. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's saying, yay, there's no <laughs> VR attraction. <laughs> um, but, but we are working on a lot of the things that, that go into things like VR, and, and it's, uh, those things, I think, are important. This is an example of something you can go see today at, uh, um, at Guardians of the Galaxy at Disneyland. Um, the, these are little characters called uh, Vilu. They're, they're fully autonomous. They have little brains. They, they uh, like people. They can see each other. People love them. They take pictures. They talk to them. These little characters are programmed to like people like people around they like each other they they like to look at each other they're afraid of loud noises they they like when you talk to them and and they're really kind of mesmerizing to look at and and it's kind of cool because in this queue for this this attraction is part of the story and it makes sense as part of that story and it it goes uh, it and it works that way so I'm sorry and and they um, they, they can see you, they can talk, they can, uh, or they can't talk, but they can, they can make their little sounds and interact with you. Um, this is a little uh, character, there he is, um, that is uh, uh, from the film Tangled. We, we explored, uh, we've been exploring things like what happens when you take a puppeteer, a person who, who can walk around with a character and can interact with you, have a conversation between you, the, the character, there we're going a little Frankenstein on us, but, uh, 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 between you and the character, and, and people love this. They go up and they pet him on the head. They, they want to interact with him, and, and he makes sense in that world as a character, and it's fun to interact with him, uh, uh, and, and that works as a narrative e of, of uh, experience. Um, this is a guy that's in at Disneyland every now and then. He's, uh, we, we asked, uh, I asked the team, I said, you know, let, let's, build, let's build a rolling robot that you could believe works at R&D, that is just one of the employees. In fact, I want you not to make something interesting. I want you to make something that is completely boring, that when you walk by, you just say, yep, he works there. That it's not something that's trying to stand out, but in fact, part of the, the fabric of the place. And so this is a character that was built, and then we take him now to uh, Disneyland, and, and he works there sometimes as we're doing testing. But this is about a character that that is fully autonomous. He has no programmer. There's no one. There's no operator. There's nobody with a, a um, uh, with a joystick driving him around. He has his own job to do. He has his own uh, route that he follows and things he has to do. Th there's an impossibly cute thing that that uh, young girls do with him sometimes, where they'll walk along and they'll put their arm around him and walk with him, and it's just just painfully cute. Just to watch him. It's like that's her, their little brother or something. I don't know what it is, but but they do that, and and it is neat. And 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 that's the point is that if you get this right, people do want to be around these characters, and they don't have to be that smart. They just have to fit into the world we're talking about, unless. Uh, lest I, I lead you uh, astray and thinking that 
the, that what we're talking about here is, is expensive, high-tech, super high-resolution uh, uh, R&D projects uh, meet the South Park of Disney animatronics. Uh, uh, this is Destini. Destini is a, a little autonomous guy. He's a fortune teller. Uh, we've shown him at various places uh, and uh, for as we test uh, just how we can do um, uh, interactive story with him. In this case, he he does, like I said, he's a fortune teller. And, and it's pretty interesting. He is a very low resolution character. I mean, this is a thing we built. I don't remember why we built it, but but it's been laying around forever. His his uh, the motors inside are from radio control cars. It, it's just super low tech, but people get him. People like him. They make eye contact with him, and and I say eye contact. I mean, his eyes are these sort of crooked little yellow balls with paint dots for pupils, but but he's appropriate. He makes sense. He when people walk up to him and interact with him, they get what they know what he's supposed to do. They know what they're supposed to do. They know why they're there. They know why he's there, and the interaction makes sense. And I think that's an important uh, uh, thing to, to think about. And, and as we think about where we go with virtual reality and how we take this next step, um, I think that, that I would urge all of us to think about story, to think about making worlds and making experiences in which we know why we're there, in which we interact with, with, with characters, beings uh, that, that uh, make sense to us, that, that seem to know that we're there, that seem interested in us. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to building these kinds of places, and, and uh, I would urge all of you to do that and look forward to seeing where all this goes. So I think that once we do that, this industry will take off, that this will match the potential that, we've, that we all know that it can, uh, can do, and that uh, we're going to see this, this uh, new medium really take off. So thanks.